Hello everyone and welcome to today's last panel titled Humans and Machines, an Educational Perspective at M Schools Ed Change. My name is Alicia de Manuel and here with me are some outstanding experts in the field that are going to talk today about recommendations, tips, projects and concerns on the theme. Please do not hesitate to send your questions during the presentations of the panelists. And if you want to tweet about the session, just remember you can use the hashtag mschools at change. This panel is dedicated to one of the technologies that is rapidly expanding, adapting to all our systems and blending into our reality. Artificial intelligence has become one of the most prolific fields of technological development that affects fields not only in medicine, banking or security, just to name a few, but is increasingly beginning to also populate our educational systems. Despite being present in our day-to-day -day basis and interacting with them almost in every single moment, we don't quite know or understand how artificial intelligence works, nor we know the global consequences that they have in matters as important as privacy or our digital rights. In general, we can define artificial intelligence as making a machine behave in a way that could be considered intelligent for a human, or as the ability of a computer or a robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Often, when we talk about artificial intelligence or AI, science fiction images of threatening machines and robots that are equal to us or smarter than us come to our mind. However, we're very far away from the point where artificial intelligence would exceed human intelligence and reach what we call singularity, that is machines being much more intelligent than us. But anyway, that doesn't mean that the artificial intelligences that exist today do not pose a threat to us. And that is something that we will see throughout today's presentation. We can all agree that the main risk of AI is that sometimes we don't know how it reaches to certain results becoming a black box. And that is a problem because its results may be biased and discriminate against certain sectors of the population. So how do we prevent the apparition of biases or the effect of black boxes in our society? Well, education plays a role, a key role. And if yesterday we had a marvelous panel about digital literacy, where the panelists introduced us to AI, this, in this panel, we will have some points of view and experiences that will help us understand the way to teach and learn about AI. We want to understand the challenges and opportunities posed by the incorporation of technologies such AI or machine learning in the classroom and the way in which we can develop better ethical policies and practices. We want to seize this opportunity and talk about the importance also of educator training since capacity development is essential for the generation of an AI infrastructure in the classrooms that is safe. In conclusion, today we will talk about learning with AI, learning about AI and preparing for AI with the aim of developing new skills for the society of the future. Now let me introduce you our first panelist. Jordi Albo is deeply passionate about improving people's quality of life through technology and how this technology can be transferred from academic applied research to industrial products. His main topics of interest are embodied social agents, emotional artificial intelligence, cloud computing platforms, health tech and ed tech. Jordi has been in the academia in Spain, Netherlands and the US and has recently joined Lighthouse Tech where he empowers worldwide institutions to succeed to disrupt their technological-based business models through applied research with top companies, world-class B2B alliances, and cutting-edge tech, star tech startups. So welcome, Jordi. The virtual space is all yours. I'm afraid we cannot hear Yeah, no, 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 thank you very much. Yes, are you muted, but I don't know why it turns to mute again. <laughs> Great. So uh, thank you so much, Alicia, for this kind of introduction. Uh, I will proceed to share my screen. And the idea is like, I want to present uh, the context with two examples that I, I have been involved with. And, and through that, then I can foster some further discussions. 
Uh, the, the first one, it's a project that we have been working for over a year at Tufts University, and now it's creating a new company about that. And one of the ideas that we had at the beginning is to try to approach uh, the problem of uh, through education, keep the building community of kids that uh, they were uh, uh, for different reasons going to the hospital. So the idea is like, imagine that hospitalized kids, they can be fully immersed in a fun and engaging robotics uh, enhanced learning environment with other kids that are the former uh, classmates at the regular schools or other kids from other hospitals. And we came with the idea to provide a kind of add-on that is using a platform that already exists, it's Google Slides, and, and, and through a camera, the idea is like kids can interact, uh, share a project, code, do whatever through the same Google Slides. In, in that way, we create like a full immersive experience that combines like a physical robot that exists remotely with like a digital environment. And it also lowers the barrier of the technology that you need in your place. Because at the end, what you need, it's a, just a laptop that can be a Chromebook or a tablet uh, with a web browser. And it's a kind of analogy with the study that you are streaming the interaction with the robot. So we, our idea is to combine this uh, virtual and remote environment with like the physical interaction of kids with robots and, and putting together educational robots like Lego with uh, social robots like QT robot or uh, Cosmo. Uh, just to have an idea, it, it looks like this um, and, um, and we have been running uh, research not only here in Boston, but also in Nepal, Panama, in Spain. Uh, using uh, rural schools from uh, Pennsylvania and New Hampshire uh, and also mixing them together. Uh, and then you combine both, uh, the, the regular Google Slides with the sidebar that is cloud connected and the kids. Of course, uh, this is facing a lot of problems that we have been also presenting at the last HRI conference uh, because there's a lot, uh, we are using uh, AI power system to educate kids about robotics and AI at the same time. So we, um, I'm sorry, it's like a few um, uh, slideshows and I will go to it. So we, we, are, uh, we are creating a context that we need to be sure that uh, the human rights principles uh, are respected. So because we have interactions between students and robots, facilitators and robots, students and facilitators, facilitators and students, robots and students, but they are remotely and we don't know exactly who is interacting with, he, with who. So we need to be sure that uh, safety is achieved, that's the user protection, liability, uh, user rights, safe word, autonomy, uh, being sure that none of the kids are isolated. Uh, the principle of autonomization, minimization, and also be uh, fair with, with everyone. So we came to, to, to do the study about, okay, there's a lot of ethical and legal challenges that are implied on this project. Uh, so there's the Children's Rights Convention, uh, the, the GDPR and data law protection, a lot of uh, ISO norms and standards, um, and, and, and so on. So uh, it, it's very important to identify the different roles of different people uh, and how they, they interact uh, to support the children, uh, to include those children, uh, to prioritize fairness and non-discrimination of the children that are participating, uh, to protect that children's data because you have a lot of systems that are connecting and managing that data to for sure ensure the safety, uh, not, uh, not only in terms of like uh, physical safety, but psychological safety of the kids. And overall, because it's, we are talking about uh, in principle complex systems like it's AI, it's not considering only a black box, but provide transparency, explainability and accountability about what is going on and, uh, and avoiding uh, any potential uh, misunderstanding. So it, it's very important to identify that with all this context that we are have empowered AI systems, there's a lot of laws that apply to them. And uh, none of us, even as educational suppliers, or practitioners or educators or parents or children, we, we, don't, we don't want uh, to be sweet by anything. We don't want our child to learn about robotics and create an action that it's a kind of harassment with other kids. So, um, so it's like, uh, so this is very important. Uh, it's very important also the role of the parents in all this. Uh, the, the parents, they need to ensure the children's privacy uh, that it's normally it's through a parent consent, uh, but needs to be sure, sure that uh, that have the children's participant rights, 
so they need to monitor what is happening and what is going on. And, uh, and especially what I just mentioned that it's this children's exchange of experience because you have kids interacting between them and, uh, and, and it's, it's a different paradigm that to take into account. And, uh, and because it's like, um, there's a marvelous other speakers, I don't want to take a lot of time. I want to finish with uh, one of the uh, free books that it's published where I contributed, a uh, project led by Cesar Hidalgo, now at Toulouse University, uh, that is about how humans judge machines. So because robotics, social robotics, AI, all these are like very disruptive technology, uh, we, we don't know, it's a, a lot of normative approach, but we don't know how people are judging and, and what is happening when I'm using AI to, decide uh, the group of kids that are working together now or um, or it's like uh, or the progress of the kid or or like or the kind of support that the kids needs in order to achieve a specific task so we need to be sure uh, that um, that we can measure the in three dimensions so it's like the, the harm that we can cause the intentionality and in conclusion the wrongness of our AI power action. So in, in, in five different moral uh, domains, that is like the fairness, the, the harm, the purity, the authority, and the, and the loyalty. Uh, so in that work with Cesar, what we did, it's uh, run mechanical Turk, create a lot of uh, scenarios of AI uh, systems that were going good or going wrong, and, and how people were blaming if the action was done by people or by machines, and how people were promoting them, if, again, if it's done by people and machine. And it's wonderful that context, actions, and a lot of aspects change completely uh, how people teach machines. So in education, it's exactly the same thing. I think that we really need to empower a lot uh, the perception of the community to be sure that what we are doing, it's, uh, it's accepted uh, and it's good for the kids. And with this, I, I will finish my presentation and leave the stage for the rest of uh, the speakers. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, wow, that arises a lot of questions. Well, let's continue with the panel because I can start here asking. But anyway, let's welcome Stefania Druga, uh, which is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Washington Information School. Her research focuses on AI literacy and the design of new computing platforms for children and parents. She's a Weizenbaum Research Fellow and now worthy of the Jacobs Foundation grant. She was previously a Lego Partner Fellow during her time as a master's student at MIT. So welcome, Stefania. Thank you so much, Alicia. And thank you for, to all the Soko School team for the invitations. Hi, I'm gonna share my screen so you can also see my slides. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what it means to democratize who creates with AI and why it is important to talk about AI literacy, AI education, not from the perspective of machines teaching people or teaching kids, but actually from the perspective of having youth and parents being able to design uh, their own uh, AI systems, program their smart assistants, create and train their own custom machine learning models, make games with them, um, so that's kind of how I'm approach approaching the topic of today. Um, if you have questions and reactions to my presentation, feel free to engage uh, here in social, on social media. And uh, the reason I, I was motivated to, to do this research is because children are growing up with AI. Um, we have in North America, where I am in the United States, more than 47 million homes that have already a voice assistant. Um, and that is a big deal because uh, that completely changes the way young people relate to technology, uh, how they perceive uh, voice assistants, how they engage even with their families and like siblings and friends. So it really shifts the, the paradigm of child growing up and interacting with technology. Um, when I started doing this, uh, this work, I uh, was looking at some products like the ones in the image here, uh, we have a doll called my friend Kayla, which is a connected doll, and Mattel, large toy manufacturing, was planning to launch Aristotle, which had a camera and a voice assistant for the kids. There was a big backlash against uh, some of these devices. The connected doll got hacked, so that was like a privacy threat for, for kids, um, and Aristotle was... Um, 
pulled off the market because more than 50,000 parents signed a petition against it. However, a few months later, Alexa launched uh, Alexa for Kids, and there were no complaints about that. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how this technology short, uh, uh, swiftly integrated into not only into our lives, but also into our homes, into family homes. Um, and I think the development of these devices and technologies have been done very fast without enough research on developmental considerations, without enough research on thinking like, how do we actually make this technology work for, for kids and for, for families? Is it actually um, okay to have a device that is constantly recording to us uh, in our homes um, and from our like youngest, like earliest years of life? So that prompted me to start uh, doing research in this field as early as 2016. This was the first study we've done uh, when I was still at MIT uh, Media Lab in Lifelong Kindergarten Group. And we actually had uh, 27 families, children of all ages from as young as four years old to 10 years old, interacting with various, degree, various devices from Alexa, the connected doll, Cosmo robot, chatbots, Google Home, like we wanted to see how they perceive and interact with all of these different devices. Sorry, and, I couldn't understand, but I and, may have a few records. And what I found was that um, the younger children perceived the, the agents as friendly and fruitful. Uh, however, the older children, um, all the children perceived the agents as friendly and fruitful. The older children always said that Alexa is smarter than they are. And that was surprising to us. This was a pilot study, not a large number of participants. Still, it was surprising to see that the younger kids were more skeptical about the device intelligence, but the older kids from six and up, the moment they start going to school, they all said, oh yeah, Alexa is much smarter than me. Even if they could ask it questions that the device could not respond. So that really prompted me to, to dive much deeper into um, how like this, this idea of intelligence attribution and how kids and parents perceive intelligence for machines and how is that perception different than intelligence for people? And how does that perception change when they're able to program and train these devices. So to that end, I built this platform called Cognimates, which is meant to enable collaborative AI learning for families. It's free, it's open source, it builds on top of Scratch, so visual programming languages, but it allows children to program an entire series of extensions um, or plugins. They can program robots, like in this case, the Poppy robot, that can be trained uh, by demonstration to draw or to play games. Um, they can program uh, IoT and they can also give examples to the computer of images or text and create custom classification models with their own examples. Um, so this, this is like what the platform looks like today. Um, we have more than 18 extensions, uh, like these libraries that children can play with. So if they don't have hardware, they can just use like uh, digital extensions, uh, things for sentiment analysis, text classification. Um, and these are the, the custom training pages that we have. And what's interesting is that we actually got to collaborate a lot with various organizations, uh, including the Curiosity Machine, which created curriculum for families around the world and a competition of AI education inventions around the world. Um, and going back to this question of intelligence and how we demystify what this technology can or cannot do, what we found in studying how families um, are interacting with our platform, with the Cognimates platform, and how programming on this platform is changing their perception of smart agents is that, and, um, is that the kids become actually much more skeptical. So we ran a longitudinal study six weeks uh, in various schools, public schools, private schools, community centers, private centers. Um, we're talking more than 57 children over six weeks. And uh, each of the, the children uh, did three learning activities, a text training activity where they would give examples of funny things, serious things, then train a model with those examples. And after that, program a game where the character on the screen would react to them speaking based on the model they trained. And would try to like, it would laugh like if they said something funny and be kind of like thinking if they said something serious. Um, they also did an image training activity where they train a model to recognize like um, 
different gestures like rock, paper, scissors, and then program a game to allow them to play rock, paper, scissors with a robot or with a computer. And we also had a smartphone activity. So we asked children in the beginning and at the end of this intervention, how smart they think Alexa is, how smart they think Jivo robot is or Cosmo robot is. And we asked them the same questions at the end and asked them to explain um, and compared their answers both quantitatively and qualitatively. And across the board, we've noticed that children would become more skeptical. Um, more children would say that the device is not smarter than they are, or it's maybe smart. But uh, in the beginning, like more of them were like were saying that the device is smart. So we definitely see the shift where they're starting to question, like, is the device smart? Or are the people who are training the device smart? When can the device make mistakes? Uh, where is this intelligence coming from? And what are the boundaries of this intelligence? Um, so we just published a new paper on the topic, primarily focused on the qualitative analysis of what the children said and how they explained their sense-making process. Um, the good news is also that, because I'm Romanian and I lived, studied, and worked in many parts of the world, um, it was very important for me to do this study internationally. So also ran workshops in Denmark, in Berlin, in Sweden, in Chile, like literally all over the world. Um, and this question of intelligent attribution is also cultural because in different parts of the world, um, children and families are more skeptical of the technology. For example, in Berlin, we noticed that that's where the the kids were the most skeptical and sensitive to questions of privacy uh, and um, yeah, algorithmic bias. So um, there was a documentary done about this work on TV in Germany um, because we have a diverse team working on this project. We focus a lot on diversity. We think it's very important to attract people of all ethnicities, gender, ages to be part of this work. Um, and to have a global community that is engaged in these questions. So, and last but not least, uh, to actually involve also teachers and do teacher training. This is a teacher training I've done in Barcelona. Last time I was there at uh, a STEM uh, learning uh, festival. So yeah, our platform is currently actively being used in more than a hundred countries. Um, it's available online, cognimates.me. Um, and we're continuing to ask this question of, how do we create curriculum activities and uh, for AI literacy for families? And how do families and kids actually understand like what is algorithmic bias? What does it mean for, for machines to be unfair? Uh, why does that matter? So we created a lot of printouts and materials for, for families to engage with these questions at home. And uh, there's uh, uh, this, just got published this week. There's gonna be a book from MIT Press on the topic where I also wrote a chapter focused on, on algorithmic bias for families. Uh, this is available for, for free online. I'll post the links. And you know, if, if we're doing work in places where access to internet is tricky or access to even computers is tricky, there, there are a lot of learning activities that can be done unplugged. Uh, with very little te technology. So this is an example of work we've done with kids to classify images of corals and try to think about how could we use AI to tackle climate change or global challenges. Um, so this is work that we started to do on paper, like printing out a lot of different images of corals, figuring out how we would classify them. How do we explain what's in the image? And then based on that experience uh, and insights, try to design like very, very simple tools, like digital tools that families could, could use. This is an example for uh, coral classification where children can see how AI would classify corals versus how they classify corals, or they can start to write and draw ideas of how they would like to use this technology for different types of images. How could we use image classification to do something good for the planet? Um, and we. This, this is work that is currently in um, review, but it's going to be published later this year, um, really with a series of guidelines for um, how do we design AI interventions, AI learning activities for family uh, uh, AI literacy. And yeah, I think like to close up, uh, my vision is 
really, I think it's important for people, youth, families to have a critical understanding of AI technology. Um, and I know like we have a lot of like negative news and uh, some of them are warranted, but I also want to invite you to, to imagine like what are the things that young people and families could do with AI that they couldn't do before? Is this like an avenue or an opportunity for a new medium for creating? How do we create when we collaborate with AI systems differently than we did before? Um, so I have this future of hybrid creativity for the for for the 21st century, for preparing our kids to learn and create um, all sorts of exciting new applications. And I think it's very important to start this early um, and, and really give young people a voice too, because this is an important debate for their generation. So thank you very much. And I hope I am on time. I don't know if, if that was good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Stefania. And now let's hear another point of view by Heather Pico, which is the CEO of Apps for Good, a global technology education charity that is preparing young people to thrive in a changing world. Heather has been part of Apps for Good since 2013, having previously been its head of communications and communities and UK managing director. Before that, Heather's role included policy advisor to the government of Ontario and co-director of the Museum of Architecture, which delivers architecture and design education and innovation programs. So welcome, Heather. All right, thank you so much. And yeah, delighted to be here and so great to sh uh, yeah, share the stage with so many um, brilliant panelists. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, great. So just bear with me. Great, so yes, um, I'll first to give you a bit of an introduction to Apps for Good. Um, so we're an education charity that teaches young people how to drive the change they want to see through technology. So we have a track record of building cutting edge learning programs for schools, launching our first app development course just two years after the iPhone came on the market. If we start in the UK, um, we now have students and teachers using our materials in more than 20 countries around the world, working with primary and secondary schools in curriculum and club time. So our focus of success has been in reaching a diverse group of young people. So those experiencing disadvantages as well as engaging girls. So in 2018, we launched a machine learning course aimed at secondary schools. Um, so our goal has been to reach and engage all young people with this as all young people really should be learning about it. So we want them to understand what machine learning is, what the ethical considerations are, and then how to apply machine learning to solve a problem. So I'm just gonna pause for one second because I think it's maybe worth defining machine learning um, as that's of course what we do for our students, but I think it's maybe worth just doing quickly in the context of talking about with AI. So just very briefly, machine learning is a branch of, of artificial intelligence. And it means rather than a computer being given a set of rules to process information, Instead, it analyzes lots of data to come up with its own rules. So this has been made possible by masses of data available today, as well as faster and faster computer processing speeds. So in our course, we split into two halves. We have the first half is young people learn about machine learning and its applications and ethical considerations. The second half, they build their own product driven by machine learning to solve a problem that matters to them. So we've had thousands of students take this course now. And today I wanted to share with you our top seven learnings from these students and their teachers. So first, don't start with the tech. Instead, start with what the tech can do and how it can be applied to solve problems, how it's creative and collaborative. So we've learned that sometimes starting in what feels like a code-free zone is actually more welcoming and safe for some students. And this is especially critical for girls and, and other young people who don't really see tech as, you know, as for me. So two, um, it's important to keep it relevant to students' lives and to get under the hood of the technologies, showing young people how artificial intelligence is being used right now and how it's impacting their everyday lives. So this is an example of an exercise we get the young people to do where they reproduce Instagram's anti-bullying AI. So technology they will have come across and something they then get to break down so they can understand how it works. We also talk about Spotify and Netflix and YouTube, um, you know, again, showing young people how they're coming across this all the time. 
we found this is a really important context for young people because you know sometimes you get you know students who say, well, this isn't important to me. It's not, you know, I'm not going to have a job in tech. Why does this matter? But actually it does matter because it's impacting, you know, everything from what they might watch online to whether they get the job they might, you know, be working towards is having a huge impact on their lives already. It also dispels the notion that AI is some scary future technology with robots taking over. They can see it's there, it's every day. And also to help them see that it's not some kind of magic that, that they can never understand. Three, we found that the ethics surrounding artificial intelligence really interest students. So they really want to talk about issues of equality and fairness, the use of their data, um, echo chambers, facial recognition technology, and you know, onwards and onwards. You know, we found that having considered debates about these issues really motivates students of all backgrounds. Four, start early and ensure it's accessible. Um, so our machine learning course starts for young people aged 12 to 13. What we've done with this is we've tried to hit that sweet spot between the fully unplugged version, tech-free version on one end of the spectrum, and then at the other end of the spectrum, the one that involves much more advanced maths and statistic knowledge. So we've tried to go somewhere in, in the middle. So our course touches on algorithms. It is challenging, but accessible. We also have extension activities in Python for more advanced students or for older students. We also use some fantastic tools like Cognimits um, as a great tool, as well as machine learning for kids. Um, and as Stefania, Stefania described, both are really great tools that have easy to access interfaces. They can, young people can build their machine learning learn models and then use those to export them into building block-based tools that they're familiar with. So again, these are tools that teachers, students are all familiar with. So it's much more accessible and easy to, to integrate. Five bring industry into the classroom. So we partner with industry experts to build our course, and then we bring these experts right into the classroom um, where they give students feedback on their work. So we have volunteers from companies like Lego and BNY Mellon, Spotify, SAP, Google, Sage, and, and onwards. Our pedagogy is based on a rock climbing model. So the students are on the mountain, it's their job to reach the, the top as a team. The teachers on the ground holding the ropes facilitate the climb. And then the experts come in to provide advice when students get stuck or they just need, they need some encouragement. So this has been a really useful scaffolding for teachers as it fills in gaps in their knowledge um, and helps motivate students when things inevitably get difficult. Um, it also shows young people how directly their learning connects to real jobs, real work that's happening right now. And it boosts their confidence because somebody from industry is taking their ideas seriously. Six, support teachers. We've seen that our teachers are really excited about this and they want to upskill themselves. So, so for example, during the pandemic, we thought, you know, there's no way people are gonna take this on as it, you know, might be new or challenging. Um, but actually we had teachers take this on during lockdown as they felt it was really relevant for the students. They wanted something relevant and creative for the students to work on. So we try to do some of the hard work for our teachers um, by creating high quality resources they can adapt in the classroom and we provide all this for free. So our teachers tell us that um, our programs not only upskill them on teaching, programming and problem solving and teamwork, but that they also improve their confidence and that they learn new teaching methods. And then seven, young people's creativity is endless. We get students working in teams, developing a product using an iterative approach where they learn to build fast, get feedback, going from problem to prototype to pitch, just like in the business world. So here students build their skills in teamwork, communication, design, research. They develop their confidence and resilience seeing that failure is part of the problem solving process. So in our program, students must come up with their own idea for the product. It can't be provided by us or the teacher. And certainly this, this is challenging um, and we've actually found in machine learning it's more challenging than in our other courses. Um, and also there are certainly large scale applications of machine learning um, and challenges around accessing and using data sets. But we've learned that it's really useful for students um, to work on a project that's relevant to them because we've seen this, you know, this motivates their learning because again, as things get difficult, they're always coming back to something that they care about. And we've seen this approach can generate some really creative ideas. So just some of the products we've had have been to make revision easier, um, to reuse everyday objects, to improve dental health and to reduce noise pollution. 
This is an example of one game-changing idea we have from students called Ultra IR. One of the girls on the team has a sister who was born with a hole in her heart that wasn't picked up in utero when it was much easier to detect. Um, and that would have prevented her sister from living eight years with an undiagnosed heart condition. So why did this happen? Well, her, her family, she and her family live in a rural community where they don't have access, universal access to sophisticated diagnostic tools. So she and her teammate came up with the idea for Ultra IR. Uh, which uses machine learning for ultrasound screening. So help, you know, this will help bring down the cost so that rural communities like hers can access more sophisticated diagnostic tools and ensure conditions like her sister's are caught as early as possible. So those are our seven key learnings um, and what we've learned to engage a truly diverse group of young people. So we're working with hundreds of schools right now um, and we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to get involved. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, Heather. It's been, it's, it's, it's been amazing. So uh, just to remember our audience that you can leave your questions uh, on the auditorium and we will, we will connect to them later. So we'll have um, the last presentation of our today's last panelist, last but not least, that is going to be Judy Fusco. Um, she has spent much of her career working to help close the gap between practitioners and researchers. She began her career co-founding an online community for education professionals called Taped In. Additionally, for many years, she taught graduate courses about learning for educators. She currently helps lead the Center for Integrative Research in Computing and Learning Sciences circles. Here, she works to broaden the impact of the many funded projects by translating and sharing findings around emerging technologies for educators and helping connect researchers and practitioners. So without further ado, Judy, welcome. Hi everyone, um, I'm excited to be here and um, I hope I'm okay. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, I want to, I'm going to share my screen one minute and tell you a little bit about the work we're doing in circles on educators, artificial intelligence and the future of learning. So um, I work with educators a lot um, and I've known that for a long time that if technologies don't fit in the classroom or work for teachers, they won't actually Sorry, can you present your presentation? Oh, I'm sorry, it's button? not present. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Great. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if, if technologies don't fit into classrooms or work for teachers, they're not going to make a difference for students. So I really think that closing the gap between um, researchers and practitioners is very important, and that's what the main theme of my work has been. Last summer at the Center for Integrative Research in Computing and Learning Sciences, or CIRCLES, I got to participate in the expert panel on AI and the future of learning. Um, these are, the, the experts are NSF funded or National Science Foundation funded researchers in the United States. And we're thinking a lot about students we're thinking a lot about equity and ethics. We're thinking a lot about how AI might fit into a classroom. They're thinking a lot about innovative assessments, teacher support, and learning environments. So these are all things um, that are a bit different than what you tend to hear about in the news right now. There's a lot of talk about surveillance. There's a lot of talk about test taking and cheating in AI and we're thinking a lot about um, AI in learning for good. Um, so it's, it's, it's a place that I really wanted to share some of the research that's going on with you all. That's what the educators in educator circles work with me to do. Um, and my educators and educator circles are thinking about Black, Latinx, Indigenous students, they're thinking about language learners. They're thinking about LGBT, LGBTQIA students and students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And each educator that I work with brings a new perspective 
and very important questions to the conversation. And that is why I bring my educators everywhere I go, except they're not here with me today, and I wish they were. Um, so these are 21 of the 22 authors, um, or, or ex experts at the um, Institute last summer. And they're working, as I mentioned before, to bring new AI systems to promote social interaction among students while they're learning. Many AI systems keep students isolated on computers, not all, but many. And the researchers on this panel want to design systems in the future that will allow more natural interactions among students and students with AI systems and students with teachers and maybe even to help students learn to collaborate better. Um, another area of interest is to design new AI systems that would help teachers do more rapid and useful assessments that can inform teaching and learning during courses. Um, and perhaps AI systems might be able to help students document competencies that are just being captured now. Um, for example, skills in collaborating on a project team. So from the report, what did the experts recommend? Well, there are seven recommendations and I'm not going to read them all now, um, but you, know, you can tell from the first one, investigate expanded range of learning scenarios we could benefit a great deal from having teachers and educators involved in this conversation. Um, so the bottom line is to get more educators involved from my perspective, and that's why I'm here today. I wanted to go into a little bit of our thinking around AI versus IA or artificial intelligence versus intelligence augmentation. Um, we come from the perspective of human-centered design, and we think that computers and technologies should really be used to enhance a human's abilities and strength, abilities and strengths. We don't want to replace humans. We want to augment human intelligence. So we are concerned with ethics and equity at every step, and we don't want to replace. And my slide is not moving on. It's probably going to jump by two in a minute. Um, yeah. OK, so yeah, I knew it would jump. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so um, there we go. I'm going to go through a little bit more about what are AI and machine learning. And we have two definitions up on the screen. The first is artificial intelligence, and that's a branch of computer science where we're trying to use algorithms to develop AI systems to make decisions and predictions. Then we have machine learning, and Heather gave us a nice definition before. Mine is pretty similar that it's a branch of AI that uses algorithms that can learn on their own and change what they do, the decisions and predictions they make as they learn. So I am going to, hopefully my screen will shift. I've pushed the button and we are waiting for technology. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to train an ML system to identify cats. And I don't know if you're yet seeing cats. I am not. Um, but I've gotten this um, data, this prototypical cat data from someone. And I don't know why my screen won't go. Um, so I've gotten this prototypical cat data. And I'm going to teach my ma machine learning system to identify cats. I don't want it to identify trucks or bikes. I just want it to identify cats. Um, and in my prototypical cat data that's not showing on the screen, let me see if I can, uh, there we go. Um, I hope you're seeing cats now. In my prototypical cat data, we see lots of cats. We see cats doing different things, doing different activities. Sometimes they're alone, sometimes they're not alone, sometimes um, they're from different angles. And my data for the machine learning algorithm is labeled cat or not cat. 
So in the top row, we have cat, cat, cat. And the second row, we have not cat, cat, not cat. Um, I let the machine learn, uh, the machine learning algorithm learn. And I've been told by machine learning, out, uh, machine learning experts that I'm just supposed to let the algorithm do its thing and learn on its own. And it will determine how to figure out if we have cats present or not. Um, and now I have to test it. So I'm using different pictures of cats to test to see how well it's going to predict that there's a cat in the picture. I get really good hit rate data. I'm super excited. This data is different than what I trained it with and I'm very excited by um, my results. Good hit rates, low false negatives, low false positives. Um, in my test data, there are no labels. It's doing well. Now I send it out to the world and this is some new data that the machine learning system is encountering. And it's telling me this is not a cat. I'm kind of surprised. So I'm going to go back to my, to think about, you know, what went wrong, because I think this is a cat. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, when I look at the data I used to train and test the system, there might have been some biases in the data, and I didn't notice it. Um, I was told they were prototypical cats, so I trusted it. But that's why we need more people involved in the conversations so that we can get more diverse perspectives on the data that we're using to train systems. And when we are classifying students, we need to be very sure that we're not going to do harm on students. Um, so this example seems kind of contrived, but you know, along the way machine learning systems were making these kinds of mistakes. Um, one system was trained to recognize fish and it had a problem because it was trained on internet data where most of the people were holding up their fish for dinner, the fish that they just caught. And then when the machine learning system saw fish swimming, it didn't recognize fish. Same thing happened with sheep. Sheep are usually in grassy fields. And when a machine learning system did not saw sheep not in grassy fields, it wasn't sure what to do with them. So um, I'm not sure if my slide is going to ever move on. I pushed the button a minute ago. We'll see what happens. This is kind of a, like a fun little um, flying blind. OK, I do see my questions educators should ask. Um, so we came up with some questions that educators should ask. And I've been talking with my educators. And we're thinking a lot about this. And I'd love to talk with you more about this during our question and answer session. I also put together a set of resources and I sent the slides to Alicia so you all can explore any of these um, readings and other organizations that I'm linking to um, on your own. And um, what can you do? As a teacher, we really need you in these conversations. Um, so I hope that you'll ask questions about these technologies from a place of knowledge, caring, and value of your students and their communities. Um, I've also got a link if you want to join Educator Circles. Um, we would love to have you and your perspective is very important. That's great, Judy. That looks like the rebellion of the machines with your PowerPoint, huh? <laughs> and, and also Stefania's Alexa's over there like trying to speak like, hey, I'm here. Don't talk about me anymore. So thank you very much for your all, all of your presentation. It's been super inspired, inspiring. Uh, while we receive questions from the audience, I have like a ton of questions. I would like to know, I, and these questions I want to address to all, all of you, but more, but like a, more of what uh, Jordi and Stefania were saying, like um, how do you get but the parents involved into these questions of AI and, and education, because it looks like it's, it's, it's a whole new world. It's like the wild, wild west. And it, it looks like super overwhelming uh, for, for parents to try to um, teach their kids what an algorithm is, how Alexa works. What do you think about this? 
I don't know if Stefania wants to go first or it's me. Uh, um, I know. So um, that that so so the, the well the, the idea to to approach that it's in, in one side we are trying to provide uh, sessions where we are explaining what we are doing even if it's related to a school or it's a different activity. And then uh, in some others, it's like uh, like the, the work that I'm doing with Empowered Brain Institute that we are targeting uh, hybrid so communities of children with autism together with neurotypical kids all doing a STEM activities and we're using these platforms. It's like it's those activities that we have the full involvement of the parents during the sessions. Uh, but but at the end, I think in, in my opinion, and, 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 and then it's like, and then Stephanie can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, it has to be also as a parent, it has to be very proactive from the parent side uh, in order to, to care about, about this topic. Yeah, I, uh, thanks for the question, Alicia. I think um, COVID really changed uh, parents' involvement in kids' education and also relationship with technology because families were stuck at home, parents for the first time were exposed to what online learnings look, looks like, what content their kids were exposed to, how prepared or unprepared the teachers and the school systems were to, to do this learning online. And they had to mediate like children's relationship with technology much more than before. Um, so I really think that it uh, opened an opportunity for parents to get more involved in conversations around uh, these topics with kids. And in the studies I've done, uh, we tried to recruit like very diverse families. So we had uh, families in North America uh, for five weeks and these were, you know, uh, Latino families, they were African-American families, they were like all sorts of different educational background, occupations, use of technology. Um, and I would say that across the board, uh, families are interested in their children to know about technology. They realize technology is part of the future. And even if they have this technology at home or not, they do want their kids and themselves to learn about it. I agree with you that it's too much pressure, maybe too much to ask from a pa parent to explain machine learning or algorithms to kids when they don't know it themselves, right? And same goes for teachers. So I think the approach um, for parents, for teachers, for all of us is to take the hat of a, of a learner and realize that our role is not to, to teach or to have all the answers, but more be open to kind of play and explore and discuss and, and learn together. And um, in the guidelines that I shared in my slides very briefly, like a really big part of kind of the coaching we do for families is to have this balanced partnership between parents and kids. Um, so it's not the parents that dominate the interaction or the conversation, um, but they are very much learning alongside their, their kids. Definitely. That reminds me when, when you were talking about Alexa, um, I don't remember exactly who wrote it, but there was this article of some parents complaining about Alexa's behavior with the kids because kids are getting used to asking things without saying please or thank you. So there was these parents that were asking Amazon to introduce, I mean, as long as Alexa is being part of uh, children's education, no? Uh, and they are asking questions and they are, you know, like getting, getting comfortable with this technology. It's like how, how, I mean, it's also a question that I would like uh, Heather and Judy, address to Heather and Judy. What is the role of uh, industry playing in this education through AI? What do you think? Because you have more experience working with companies ahead, uh, um, along with education and AI. So what is the role of them? Or do you think that they are, I don't know, like they are sitting in the path or what do you think about it? <laughs> Heather and I are wondering who wants to go first. Do you want to go first, Heather? <laughs> sure, yeah, I can, I can jump in a bit with our experiences. I mean, I think industry is really interested in getting involved in this from what we see. In fact, a lot of industry create their own programs um, 
to, to educate young people about things. So obviously for, for various reasons that they want to get involved, I think they do have an interest in ensuring there's a good pipeline of, of people who can work for them. And, and so I, that is part of it that they, you know, and I think there's, there's lots of evidence coming out about that gap and, and, and not just in, in engineers, but also people who understand how to use the technology. And then on the flip side, you know, the engineers who have the, the kind of broad skill set around communications and, um, you know, the ethics side as well, or educating in that. So I, you know, I think industry um, very much wants to be a part of this and is doing more and more, whether that's, you know, from Google through to IBM through to, yeah, Salesforce, everybody. Um, so we definitely see that. I mean, we are, we're funded by industry and, and partner with them to help, as I mentioned, bring those experts into the classroom. So it has an impact um, on our young people. And, and I think it's a really important part of of the puzzle. It's important for young people to see how their skills and interests transfer and to see what industry really looks like. So I think bridging those two is, is also is really critical for young people. And, and as I spoke about in my talk too, also very helpful for teachers. Mm -hmm. I had a yeah, quick... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sir. Go ahead. I, I just had a quick reaction to build on what Heather said. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think uh, so as a, as a PhD candidate, I also teach undergraduates and I taught a class on AI ethics for undergraduates and in informatics these like they they're going to take a job in tech, uh, either as developer IT workers and UX designers. And I think it's 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 very complicated because on one hand, and I collaborated extensively with Microsoft Research, Google and others, but I do think that we've seen in recent uh, months. Um, really big problems around how these large companies, um, you know, sometimes invest in board for AI ethics, or they have like, they hire diverse scholars for AI uh, fairness and research, uh, AI research. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes like how much of this interest or engagement is genuine and how much of it is actually to kind of save face or to say like, we are we are doing something about this, but it takes a lot for change, for meaningful change to, to happen. Joy Bolonami, who was my colleague at MIT, who did um, uh, this research and documentary on gender shades and like showing like all the discrimination for African-American people in terms of computer vision, like she was shunned initially by Amazon and all these other large companies, right? Because they didn't want to admit fault. Um, so I, I think from where I'm standing, and especially knowing that I'm talking directly and you know, um, teaching the, the undergraduates that will go and get these jobs in tech, I think we also have a responsibility to engage ethics in computer science education at all, across all levels, right? So it's not just like, I'm writing the code, I don't know how it's being used or uh, we have an AI ethics, um, I'm sure they're gonna take care of this, or we have responsible AI guidelines, problem solved, right? So I think it's really, really problematic. We've seen this year, what can happen, like our democracy is at stake, our health is at stake, like everything we do um, is mediated by this, you know, misinformation bubbles and lack of good policies at times and regulation for these big tech companies. Um, so I think it's highly problematic. And I think it's, you know, our institutions and our duty as citizens and educators and researchers to hold these large companies accountable um, because their technologies and decisions have such a huge impact. Yeah, I wanted to echo that. Thank you. That was really important, um, Stefania. One of the other problems that I see is when we have large companies who collect data and we don't necessarily know what the data is going to, how the data will be used and who will see the data. Um, one of the questions that we have for educators to ask is what, what is the company's model for their data that they're collecting? Will it be used only for the, the purpose specified? Will it ever be sold? Um, and, you know, I've seen some companies that are smaller and they put that in their core values that this data will never be sold. We're going to anonymize and de-identify the students as quickly as possible. And, you know, this, and that's how we will make it more safe for the students. And there's still a ton of questions about when student data gets recorded, does it get deleted? 
um, Sophia no Noble will talk about how she's like, she would be horrified if a paper from when she was 18 shows up in her life now. I mean, so students, you know, part of learning is like forgetting some of the old stuff. And with technology, we may not have that ability to forget. Um, and the other point that I was going to bring in um, is some of the companies are, have really great AI folk but they don't necessarily have the subject matter experts or the pedagogical experts that teachers are. Um, and, you know, I think that we need more people in the conversation. That's sort of my, my line today is we need to bring in more diverse people and teachers represent a lot of different populations and they often love the populations that they work with. And we need to have those teachers in the conversation. Um, so those are just a couple more thoughts on that. And you see, kind of to to echo what you were saying, because I I I know that today we have a lot of educations, a lot of teachers uh, listening to us. Some of them maybe don't understand what what is going on with artificial intelligence, but they heard of it. And, and a question for all of you, what are your recommendations if someone wants to initiate themselves into artificial intelligence? How do they do it? What, what are your recommendations? So I think about that question a lot um, because I work with teachers a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't want to blow my own horn and I'm not because I work with educators and they do the writing on the subject. And I would love to have more teachers taking a look at some of the writings that they're doing. Um, so, you know, check out the resources we have. Check out all of the resources here today are great. It sounds like for learning more about um, AI and machine learning. So, um, and I think it can be really scary diving into this new area but that's kind of what it takes. You know, you have to dive in. You, maybe you have to pretend to be a machine learning algorithm yourself. At first, it's not going to make any sense. You're going to read words and you're going to be like, I have no idea what this means. But that's the amazing thing about our human brains is the first time we read it, we don't get it. The second time we read it, some new things come in. The third time we read it, it's starting to make more sense. And, you know, it is going to take an investment in yourself to um, learn about this. And it's a really important investment because the stakes are really high. Um, AI seems to be everywhere right now, but we don't know how much it really is everywhere or how much it's going to become even more um, ubiquitous. So I think that jumping in now, it's the perfect time. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I also recommend the AI for K-12. Um, it's written AI for K-12.org. Um, it's a collection of resources. It's started by teachers uh, here in North America, but they have members of the community from Europe, from all different parts, South America, Southeast Asia, from all over the world. And anyone can submit resources and also kind of explore everything from books to classes to all uh, repositories of tools that exist. So I think that's a very good place to, to start. Yeah, I'll um, add that I put the, that resource on my slides too. It's not just our resources from circles, but we work with a lot of NSF funded projects and they are also one of them um, that, that is funded by the National Science Foundation and there's some other um, there's some other NSF funded projects as well on my resources. Yeah, and I'll just, I mean, to echo what you said there, uh, what everybody's been saying there about not needing to start from scratch, that there are so many really great things out there already and, and communities of teachers. So, so like Judy suggesting and, and many others. And so there's other people kind of on the same journey. So always uh, encourage that. Um, and then the other thing to mention is, is different resources that help combine interests. So code.org has um, lessons on AI and how we can help keep our oceans clean. So lots of also things where it can pair different interests that might be either things that you're interested in exploring in your classroom or things that might motivate your students as well. Jordi, do you want to add something to well, I think that it's like it's 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 almost everything is is said. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the, these uh, 
the role of AI that it, that it's super important. It's in in terms of analogy, it's similar to what happened when uh, students start to have access to internet, uh, and that uh, that is like that we, we learn without internet, and and now with internet. And I saw my daughters and my two daughters, they are proactively even when they are working at school, they are constantly accessing to different. Uh, internet and they had to have the digital literacy to in order to do that in a proper way uh, and i think that with ai it, it, it requires the same things and, uh, and what i was hearing it's accessing to the materials and also working with the community participating together with multiple teachers and learning from experience from other teachers it's it's the key but, but in order to start to play all the the tools that were presented from stefani and from from the others so these are great tools that they can start to to play to realize about uh, they, they need to learn by doing like the kids <laughs> and, uh, and and not by listening experts only <laughs> especially that <laughs> so as jordi was talking i realized um heather has some her great findings on what kids like and she started with don't start with the tech um, and I think that that's really good advice for teachers too. read about issues and think about what this means to you and your classrooms. Um, so I think that's a really great place to start too, because some of the, the tech will be overwhelming and a lot to learn, but that's, a, but that's not the point. The point is to add your voice in understanding the implications for your classroom, something you are expert on and we we researchers and um, AI developers don't know that piece. So we need you to add in your voice. And I would also like to say that there is a gap. I mean, we do have resources and tools, but I think there's still a need to, to create um, materials and uh, that are directly directed at teachers and educators. I've been discussing with Nancy Otero, who is now the director, uh, director of learning at MAKE, and um, there's all this like wonderful work that has been done in maker education, maker communities, STEM education. How do we connect that with AI machine learning and applications, right? So really kind of closing the gap. If you wanna do something in your community that is relevant for and makes your life better and you have the expertise in like what is needed and how to go about it, how can we actually build on existing like communities and skills um, from STEM maker education, but integrate that also maybe with AI, uh, if it makes sense. So Nancy and I are planning to kind of collaborate on, on a book on that topic and very much project-based learning where we start with a problem, like how do we deal with noise pollution like you Heather had in her examples and like really build a very simple but concrete project that people could build at home. Um, and I definitely think that there's a lot of space and, you know, if educators and people in the audience, like if you have ideas for projects or expertise for projects, like do engage because there's still a lot of work to do in this space. Definitely, definitely. Um, something that all of you have gone through uh, at some point of your presentations and something that is very important for me is ethics involved in AI. And, and uh, you've been talking about, I think it was um, Heather who said that kids are getting more involved because the ethical concerns are appealing to them. So, and something that um, Stefania was saying previously is like, okay, we have companies that they are trying to fix some of the errors that uh, they have committed, uh, maybe because they didn't think about it at the beginning, but what do you think would be the technology of the future? Do you think that uh, having kids involved in ethical concerns right now will make an impact for the technology of the future? So I have um, three teenagers in my house and they have a lot of perspectives on um, the technologies. And they have, I mean, and they've grown up with it and they have a lot of um, insights that adults can't have. So I absolutely think that they're going to be bringing in great new ideas um, and a lot of new understanding about societal um, norms that adults may or may not understand as well. Um, so absolutely, kids are going to be so essential in, in helping get, to help create better AI. 
Um, so, so yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I would also say I really like the, the examples we learned from your presentations today and um, yeah, the apps for good, like when you see teenagers who work on heart diseases, right, and like it's so meaningful. Um, I do think um, it, the age makes a difference. Like one thing that I noticed is that teenagers and maybe undergraduates um, are more like are definitely hungry for working on ethics, learning about ethics, they care about it, they want to do something about it much more so than generations before. I think with younger children, like we're talking 10 and younger, it's a little bit more tricky. Like it really depends how we frame it. Because when I go to younger kids and tell them about self-driving cars, they don't necessarily think that's fun. Like they think driving a car is fun, right? Or they love playing games and even the rock, paper, scissor game, like, oh yeah, like I want to build a game and play with my friend, play with the machine. But in doing that, like if it's framed correctly, like we could discuss ethics too. Like, why does the game work with my hand but doesn't work with your hand? Um, do, and, you, and then they care about it because they want to play with their friend. And it's like, oh, why does the machine not, not recognize my friend? It has, oh, it's because she or he has a different skin tone and I only put pictures of people with my skin tone, right? So like, how do we break it down? And what's the good entry point? I think that really depends on age um, and developmental stages. Um, but I absolutely agree that it's crucial to think about this, start to have these discussions early on, and maybe find the uh, right approach that is most appealing for, for young people at the stage of where they're at. Yeah. I, 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 would like, uh, I would like to add um, uh, something to, to this conversation that I think that it also was coming, coming from, from Heather, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, or maybe, or maybe Judy. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know exactly, but it was about uh, that uh, the transition between artificial intelligence and intelligence augmented. So some of the things that uh, we we really need to to encourage kids to be educated. So in the past, it's like, uh, and I'm com coming from a Lasallian educator, where we we were educating people because through education you are providing uh, opportunity and hope to everyone. Now it's with artificial intelligence, we are going to provide opportunity and hope to everyone. And it's not an option to not deal with artificial intelligence. So this is a real thing. And, and everything that it's like uh, Stefania, Judy and Heather were exposing about how these kids, they need to regarding about ethics and about all the different aspects. It's, it's exactly just to be sure that it's like they, they even are completely in the wrong direction about what they are doing. Uh, and, and and this is uh, this is this is happening. But but again, it's like I think that if we think with the uh, internet and what was happening when someone was entering in another uh, classmate Facebook and they were putting a joke in behalf of the other and what was representing and uh, and then how we have been to educate kids about uh, identity. Uh, right now, we we also need to uh, um, help them to 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 learn about that. And, and yeah, and, and also it's like it's 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 multiple generation things. It's uh, now because uh, technology it uh, evolves exponentially. It's uh, a different. It's like a right now also it's like with uh, also running a company right now. I realized that I have employees from multiple ages, from interns to millennials, and now it's dealing with multiple uh, generations with a completely different perspective of the technology and the roles. And the projects, and it also applies to, to this. But but definitely, I think that for good, we are moving towards a society that caring much more about values, ethics, and um, and, and this is coming from education. And and, and yeah, and, and, and that's it. Um, yeah, it's uh, only to probably really mostly echo all the points there about that we. I think we have to. I you know agree. I think young people. I need, you know, I talk, mentioned this a bit in passing about how, you know, you can look at machine learning or artificial intelligence or see it as some kind of magic that like you can never understand. It's just this thing happening and and actually we need to help them see they can understand it and they, they can and they should ask questions. And I think, you know, as touched on, 
there is, you know, we know young people, for instance, are more likely to demand, demand more of so the companies they buy from and the companies they go to work for. So I think that is, you know, there in, you know, certainly in this context, of older, you know, young people, secondary school and older, um, who, who sort of probably are naturally inclined already are influenced through other factors, yes, like education exactly around this. So I think it is really important. Um, and, and key to do for young people. They, we need them to ask these questions. We, we need that pressure coming. Um, and um, we need them to see they can be empowered by the technology, that they can use it for things that they care about and they want to tackle. Um, and probably related to this for me always, when we talk about the ethics is also about the diversity side, is that we need a diverse group of people working in AI and, and using AI to solve problems because we're then more likely to have different perspectives in terms of tackling some of these ethical issues. So I think when we're talking about young people, we need to not just be educating the young people who are interested in this, we're self-selecting it because their parents tell them to do it, but that it's all young people. And that's, you know, Stefani has talked on too about the different backgrounds, all young people from all backgrounds, because we need all of those perspectives to make sure that we get this right. I mean, we know that diverse teams build better products. We also know, you know, diverse teams are gonna be more likely to identify the vast array of kind of ethical issues that come up through, through this. I, I wanted to ask you something because we have been talking about how to learn about AI or how teachers and education can learn about AI, but something that was relating with what Judy was saying about intelligence augmentation, what do you think about the products of AI that are being used in order to help teachers uh, sort of like facial recognition used in order to know if a kid is getting interested in a, in a subject or, or things like that. Are we, are, we, are, we, are we doing our teachers dumb? Are these technologies really helping us? Is it necessary to have in a classroom a camera that tells us our students are interested in this topic? What do you think about that? So. Uh, let, let me jump pretty pretty quick uh, to that, and, uh, and 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 this is like what I'm going to mention. It based on research from my wife, not from mine. <laughs> so it's like I will talk in behalf of her. But but it's really that a huge gap that teachers uh, have right now. It's feedback from what is going on with the students, and then uh, in order to provide a, be a better learning experience, we truly believe that we need to uh, increase this feedback in real time and provide all those informations. Uh, of course, getting data and processing this data to get this feedback, and it's something that we are trying to do with the Google Slides project. It's like it's 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 creating like this context that we are like maybe uh, getting extra information that uh, shouldn't be used only for a specific purpose. Uh, but uh, but I have seen the benefits of technology like that, like the one that you were mentioned that it's a, for a company called BrainPower uh, that it's also based here in, in Boston that it's. Um, it's um yeah it's 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 otherwise you can don't know it like if they are like uh it's uh it's focusing it if they are focusing if I, i'm i'm connecting with them or not um uh, so yeah stefania do you want to add something i see you eager <laughs> to jump on the screen about this um yeah i i just wanted to say that i think sometimes we think we need more data or we want more data, but um, I'm not sure. Yeah, there, there was this like quote, like we're, we're drowning in data and looking for, for meaning, right? And uh, I am a little bit concerned at times, like I see, especially in China, where they already have this technology in the classroom, companies like Squirrel AI and others, um, are implementing solutions of analyzing facial descriptions of kids in the classroom live or having like a dual teacher system. We've probably, many of us have heard about the social scores. Um, so I, I am concerned about how these technologies, if we integrate them in the classroom uh, and in schools, whenever like someone comes with a new solution, like now I'm like, how can it be misused? Or like, what are like the risks that we're not anticipating that, uh, or the challenges that we're not anticipating? How can we learn from our mistakes from the past when we were more kind of techno progressive and uh, thought like, oh yeah, this is gonna be great. It's gonna make people's lives better. Um, so I actually think that um, 
while while I recognize and you know my mom is a teacher she's been a teacher for 40 years in Romania and like I taught a lot I, I do think it's it's helpful for um, teachers to get feedback from their students but I don't necessarily think that you know like tracking their vitals or their faces is the best way to get that feedback um, and um, yeah I don't know I mean I I think this is not necessarily a direct response to your question, but I would encourage uh, my panel colleagues and everyone who's watching to take a st step back and not see this AI technology as a train that is coming and we cannot stop and it's happening. We decide when we use it, if we use it, if it makes sense to use it. Um, like we are like the community, the people, the society that is making these decisions. So on its own, the AI doesn't do anything. Um, so I think for me in all of my work, and that's why I was showing also activities we're doing on paper, where it, it's always important to ask, like, do we need the technology? How does the technology actually add value here or not? Um, thanks. I was going to jump in with something to tag along with what you were just saying. Um, if you remember in my AI definition and my ML definition, in both definitions, we've got algorithms making decisions for people. And there are some times when I don't want an algorithm to be making the decision. And I think that that question of, do we need an AI right now, right here in this situation is a really important question. Um, a new AI postdoc who's working with us on circles asks that question all of the time. Is AI necessary here? Could we do it another way? And I absolutely agree, teachers need more feedback. And if society is pushing us to have larger classes because there's less money for teachers, you know, that's a problem. The money is going to AI development. I mean, there's a lot of money going there. So, you know, I think there is, I think this is one of those questions that teachers can say, hey, does, it doesn't make sense to me. I get enough data from interacting with my students and I don't need this and it's going to take me this long to learn how to use this. I mean, that's one of the other things as we're creating these new systems that are going to require teachers to relearn how to do what they already do really well. So I think the question of slowing the train down. I don't know if we can stop the train, um, but I think that asking these questions and really being thoughtful and more, the more people, I'm going to keep saying that, the more people that ask these questions, the better. We have a question from the audience that is kind of related to what we were talking, what we are talking right now. It's from Sara. She's asking, how do you see the impact of a that AI might have in transforming assessment, for example, uh, shifting from assessments that provides isolated scores to continuous assessments that update how a student is progressing through learning trajectory over time. Could it benefit personalized learning? So I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, I think that you know our visions for how um, AI assessment could help. I think, um, I think the question alludes to some of the visions that yes, we could get data over long periods of time. Maybe we could also assess, assess in a different way so that we're not um, having, so the way we assess determines how we teach, whether we like it or not. And right now we're teaching for summative kinds of tests that may be high stakes that may also only get at a narrow piece of the learning that's needed around that subject matter. Um, you know, maybe with AI, we could expand what we can assess so that we could get a better understanding of what students know in writing and in more and in ethics um, rather than testing for facts and things. So I think that's an important vision to think about and develop how to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's not there yet. There are some, some folks who are thinking about this and um, it's, it's pretty exciting to see possibilities. Um, but but uh, I agree that, that um, 
that it's exciting. And I also want to add, you know, it's going to take a while to get there. I have a link to, to an article that we wrote focused on this question of AI and assessments. I'm trying to find the link and, and put it in the chat. Um, I think it's, it's always very tricky assessment in general. Uh, it's like one of the most debated questions in learning sciences, pedagogy. <laughs> um, like once we start creating a metric, people kind of design their behavior and optimize it for that metric. So the metric becomes less and less of a predictor. Um, so I think just this question of like, how do we actually measure learning and assess learning um, is a very hard one, not, not to e even include AI for now. Uh, and that we don't have agreement across, you know, uh, curriculum developers, educators, policymakers around this question. Um, my stance as a constructionist primarily is very much focused on self-assessment, project-based assessment, um, not so much standardized tests. And we've seen this year, again, with the pandemic, some of the standardized tests were dropped. And actually, like the levels of engagement and um, kind of like other metrics like of, of learning, self-assessment self were in, uh, higher, right? Like increased. Um, and we've seen a more diverse population of students being able to access higher education because some of the standardized tests were dropped. Um, so I do think that, you know, like, for example, when I'm teaching and I want to find bugs in my students code, having a tool that helps me highlight those bugs is very helpful. Um, but having a tool that would tell me what grade to give them or like generate feedback for them. Uh, a little bit more problematic there, right? Um, so my my question to, I would turn back the question to, to the audience and like just invite you to think about how do you measure learning um, and which parts of that would make sense to automate uh, and which ones not. Well, we are just about to end the discussion. We have a few minutes left. Um, let me uh, wrap up the conclusions that we had today, that AI is a hands-on job, so you need to get dirty and start doing, uh, first without technology, then with technology. It's not magic, uh, it's very understandable, it's, it's easy to get, to get on, and it's a fantastic uh, field. Also, it's in inevitable. We were talking that it's a train that is not going to stop, but it doesn't mean that it has to go fast as hell uh, and it has to end um, and take everything that we know. And also that it should include educators and parents in what we are doing. Would you like to add something, something else? Some recommendations or final thoughts that you have. We haven't talked about data, about who owns the data, that it's also uh, the Pandora box. Uh, but if you want to include that in your conclusions or you have a thought about that. So I have some questions around data and the questions educators should ask. And I think, you know, take a look at, at the starting point that I'm, you know, that, I, that I'm providing that have come from my educators to think with and you know there's so much risk um, as you saw in my little ml demonstration when i used biased data i got a really weird result um, so i think we need to keep in mind just how important data is in these conversations and the question of who owns it is another one and i mentioned earlier about can it ever go away or will it follow the the learner forever um, is another big issue that that is of concern um, to me. That the right to be forgotten. Yeah, I, I just would like to add that data is part of the AI, and uh, and it's like it's considering AI without considering the data, how it's structured, and uh, how it lasts, where you are storing it. Uh, it. If we do the, also the analogy with other systems like the health system, that it's very clear how you are managing data. And even with that, there's a lot of controversy. 
So maybe we 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 need like uh, this like kind of hyper regulation for education or stuff like that that it's doing similar things uh, and and but I, I think that already it uh, it it it's just uh, asking a lot of things to the community and um and uh, obviously I don't know if you share the link of that uh, the the free book about how uh, people how humans judge machines I think that it's very relevant to us for them because uh, from that we can construct uh, what we want to have in the future. And a better understanding. So just to let know the audience, uh, the our um, panelists has shared a lot of interesting links, and we will share that with them schools as well. So I, I had a, a final parting thought, which is not everything that matters can be measured, and not everything that can be measured matters. And I think that speaks to our conversation around assessments, AI, data, um, and maybe my invitation and like something that I hold dear to my heart is this approach of creative learning and playful explor explorations. Um, some of our greatest inventions were done by people whimsically having fun and playing. And I think that's why engaging and inviting children and young people to be part of this conversation is really important. So I think that with that, we can close the session for today. It's been a marvelous experience to share this virtual stage with all of you. I think in my, in my point of view, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's, been, it's been amazing, super inspiring. Um, and we'll see all, all together and maybe in, a real, in the real world and not in the virtual world very soon. Um, thank you to M schools for hosting the event. Um, bye bye.